Hello everybody, Mentor Lawyer here. The day has come for Alec Baldwin to face justice in the matter involving the death of, of camera woman Hutchins. And I can tell you that I listened to the opening statements and I thought that both sides were persuasive, had strong uh, opening statements. Again, the opening statements are supposed to be where you make the arguments. There was quite a bit of argument in the opening statements today especially from the defense, but both seem to be very effective attorneys and uh, we have it here for you. So here we go, the opening statements in the Alec Baldwin trial. Thanks for watching, Mental Lawyer. First of all, I want you to know this trial is being filmed, but you are not being filmed and you will not be filmed at all throughout the, within the courtroom, okay? All right, so I'm going to, um, this is a criminal case, as you know. I'm going to reread the grand jury indictment. It's um, it's very formal, so we'll go with that. Count one, involuntary manslaughter, negligent use of a firearm, and then on or about October 21, 2021, in Santa Fe County, New Mexico, state of New Mexico, at Bonanza Creek Ranch, located at 545 Bonanza Creek Road, Santa Fe NM 87508. The above named defendant did cause the death of Helena Hutchins in the commission of negligent use of a firearm. Count two in the count one in the alternative, involuntary manslaughter, without due caution or circumspection, in that on or about October 21, 2021, in Santa Fe County, State of New Mexico, at Bonanza Creek Ranch. Located at 545 Bonanza Creek Road, Santa Fe, New Mexico, 87507, the above-named defendant did cause the death of Helena Hutchins by an act committed with the total disregard or indifference for the safety of others, and the act was such that an ordinary person would anticipate that death might occur under the circumstances. Again, Mr. Baldwin is presumed innocent. The burden is always on the state to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. What I say now is the introduction of uh, the case and the instructions. Along with the, those instructions previously given, these are preliminary only and may be changed during or at the end of trial. First of all, all of you must pay close attention to the evidence. After you've heard all of the evidence in the case, I will read the final instructions of law to you. You will also receive a written copy of the instructions you must follow the final instructions in deciding this case. And just so you know, there's going to be no transcript available to you. Juries have asked me that, so I'm telling you up front, okay? Again, the trial is expected to last eight days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of next week. That's the trial that does not include your deliberation time. The usual hours of trial will be from 8.30 to 5, typically with a half hour for lunch, no, an hour for lunch, and then um, a morning break and an afternoon break. Again, please report to the jury lounge no later than 8.30, unless uh, we're instructing you otherwise for different reasons. But in your mind, you can always expect 8.30 to be here, okay? Do not come into the courtroom unless you are accompanied by my bailiff, Steve, okay? You may take water into the courtroom with you, and you can also take um, coffee or tea or uh, um, if you have a lid on your um, cup, okay? We stand up out of respect for you because you are the ultimate decision makers as to the facts in this particular case. So when you come into the courtroom, you can go ahead and be seated, and then we will take our seats. And again, it's important to hear. So please raise your hand at any time you can't hear. Don't be self-conscious about it. Don't wait until a couple of questions have been asked. You've got to, if you can't hear, you've got to shoot that hand up right away, okay? All right, this is a public proceeding, so people may go in and out. You may find yourself looking at who goes in and out, but after a while, you'll get used to it. But if there is anything that is distracting you from being able to listen and be involved in this case, please tell Steve immediately. He'll let me know and I'll do my best to get rid of the distraction. As you know, the temperature we cannot control. All right, so sorry, we'll try to get the county in here if it um, plummets too high. I doubt it'll plummet too low. You are allowed but not required to take notes during trial. 
uh, Steve has given you a, a pen, uh, a pen, a pen, uh, pen. Okay. Uh, please put your name on the front page of your pad and then take notes beginning on the second page. On breaks, uh, follow Steve's instruction on whether to take the uh, pad with you or whether to leave it on, on your chair. You don't have to worry about confidentiality. They'll be locked up at night and, um, and when the trial is finished, they'll be shredded. Okay. Uh, don't let your notes take the place of your independent memory of the evidence. When taking notes, please do not forget to pay close attention to the trial. Listening and watching witnesses during their testimony will help you assess their appearance, behavior, memory, and whatever else bears on their credibility. Let's go through the order of trial for those that have uh, uh, not engaged in a criminal trial before. A criminal trial generally begins with the lawyers telling you what they expect the evidence to show. These statements and the statements made by the lawyers during the course of the trial can be of considerable assistance to you in understanding the evidence as it is presented at trial. Is there something distracting you, Juror? No. I'm talking to the other one. Okay. Statements of the lawyers, however, are not themselves evidence. The evidence will be the testimony of the witnesses, exhibits, and any facts agreed to by the parties. After you have heard all of the evidence, I will give you final instructions on the law. The lawyers will argue the case, and then you will retire to the jury room to arrive at a verdict. It is my duty to decide what evidence you may consider. Your job is to find and determine the facts in this case, which you must do solely upon the evidence received here in court. It is the duty of a lawyer to object to questions, testimony, or exhibits the lawyer believes may not be proper, and you must not hold such objection against the objecting party. I will sustain objections if the question or evidence sought is improper for you to consider. If I sustain an objection to evidence, you must not consider such evidence, nor may you consider any evidence I have told you to disregard. By itself, a question is not evidence. You must not speculate about what would be the answer to a question that I rule cannot be answered. It is for you to decide whether the witnesses know what they are talking about and whether they are being truthful. You may give the testimony of any witness whatever weight you believe it merits. You may take into account, among other things, the witness's ability and opportunities to observe, memory, manner, or any bias or prejudice that the witness may have, and the reasonableness of the testimony considered in light of all of the evidence of the case. No ruling, gesture, or comment I make during the course of the trial should influence your decision in this case. At times, I may ask questions of witnesses. If I do, such questions do not in any way indicate my opinion about the facts or indicate the weight I feel you should give to the testimony of the witnesses. Questions by jurors. Ordinarily, the attorneys will develop all pertinent evidence. It is the exception rather than the rule that an individual juror will have an unanswered question after all of the evidence is presented. However, if you feel an important question has not been asked or answered, write it down on a piece of your note paper and give it to Steve before the wit before this is important before the witness leaves the stand. Okay, I will decide whether or when your question will be asked. Rules of evidence or other considerations apply to questions you submit and may prevent the question from being asked. If the question is not asked, please do not give it any further consideration. Do not discuss it with the other jurors. And please do not hold it against either side that you did not get an answer. Conduct of jurors. Again, very important. You must decide the case solely upon the evidence received here in court. You must not consider anything you may have read or heard about the case outside the courtroom. During the trial in your deliberations, you must avoid news accounts of the trial, whether they be on radio, television, the internet, or in a newspaper or other written publication. You must not visit the scene of the incident on your own. You, can make, you cannot make experiments with reference to the case. And in this day and age, you cannot Google or research any of the subject matter of this case. Until you retire to deliberate the case, you must not discuss this case or the evidence with anyone, including each other. Very important, as I said yesterday, when you go in that room, you don't, you don't talk about the case. You wait 
until you are a jury that is deliberating, okay? If an exhibit is admitted in evidence, you should examine it yourself and not talk about it with other jurors until you retire to deliberate. It is important that you keep an open mind and not decide any part of the case until the entire case has been completed and submitted to you. Your special responsibility as jurors demands that throughout this trial, you exercise your judgment impartially and without regard to any sympathy, bias, or prejudice. To minimize the risk of accidentally overhearing something that is not evidence in this case, please continue to wear your jurors' badges while in and around the courthouse. If someone happens to discuss the case in your presence, report that fact immediately to Steve. Although it is natural to visit with people you meet, please do not talk with any of the attorneys, parties, witnesses, or spectators, either in or out of the courtroom. If you meet in the hallways or elevators, there's nothing wrong with saying a good morning or a good afternoon, but your conversation should end there. If the attorneys, parties, and witnesses do not greet you outside of court or avoid riding in the same elevator with you, they're not being rude. They are just carefully observing this rule. All right, so uh, we're going to begin the case. The case starts with opening statements. The state begins first because they have the burden of proof and then the defendant. All right, go ahead, counsel. <coughs> When someone plays make-believe with a real gun in a real-life workplace, and while playing make-believe with that gun violates the cardinal rules of firearm safety, people's lives are endangered, and someone could be killed. Ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's what this case is about. It's simple, it's straightforward. The evidence will show that someone who played make-believe with a real gun and violated the cardinal rules of firearm safety is the defendant, Alexander Baldwin. You will hear over the course of the next few days that in the fall of 2021, a movie called Rust began filming at the Bonanza Creek Ranch just south of Santa Fe in Santa Fe County. You will learn that this movie was a Western with a lot of gun action. And while it was a movie set, it was a real life workplace for many people. But you will hear this workplace was on a tight budget. And you will learn that some of the people who were hired to work at this workplace were very inexperienced. And one of those was the armorer, a very young woman named Hannah Gutierrez Reed. You will hear testimony from crew members who worked on the set, who will tell you that to them, Ms. Gutierrez's inexperience was obvious. You will also learn that this workplace has some talented people. And one of those was the director of photography, a vibrant 42-year-old rising star named Helena Hutchins. You will also learn that the director of this film was Joel Souza, another talented individual who cares deeply for his projects. The evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that like in many workplaces, there are people who act in a reckless manner and place other individuals in danger and act without due regard for the safety of others. That, you will hear, was the defendant, Alexander Ball, the lead actor on this film. 
You will learn that this movie began filming on or about October 6, 2021. But the defendant did not arrive on set to begin working until about October 13. And you will learn that prior to arriving on the set to work, he requested to be assigned the biggest gun available. So he was assigned this revolver, a replica of an 1873 single action revolver manufactured by Pieta Firearms in Italy. You will hear from Alessandro Pieta, who will tell you he manufactured this gun. And he will tell you he manufactured it in 2015. And he will explain the quality control measures that Pieta Firearms follows in order to ensure that firearms that are manufactured by Pieta Firearms don't have any problems or issues. Mr. Pieta will tell you that this firearm he himself manufactured and that when Pieta sent it to EMF, which is the company that distributes firearms for Pieta Firearms in the United States, this gun was in perfect working condition. You will hear from Justin Neal, who is a representative of EMS, EMF, excuse me, a company out of California that has historically been known to provide firearms to the movie industry. Mr. Neal will tell you that when EMF received this firearm in 2017, it was in perfect working order. And in fact, when EMF had this firearm, it was subjected to numerous quality control inspections because it was used as a show gun at gun shows. The evidence will show that in September of 2021, an individual by the name of Seth Kenny was contacted by the folks with Russ Production. They asked Mr. Kenny if he was he would be able to provide some firearms for the filming for use during the filming of Rust. You will learn that Mr. Kenny owns PDQ Firearm and Prop. It's a duly licensed firearms dealership. Mr. Kenny then contacted EMF and ordered several single action replica revolvers. And in September or on September 29, 2021, Mr. Kenny purchased this gun. And you will hear that Mr. Kenny received it from EMF and it was in perfect working order. The only thing that Mr. Kenny did to this gun was to insert the firing pin. Because since it was a show gun, it didn't have a firing pin. But you'll learn that that's a very easy step. All he had to do was just insert the pin and that's it. And then Mr. Kenny had the firearms, this one and some other firearms, transferred to the set of rust at the Bonanza Creek Ranch. And on October 13th, 2021, the defendant was supposed to have a training session with this gun and this young armor. But you will see that during this training session, the defendant had somebody or a couple of people filming him while he's running around shooting this gun. You will learn, ladies and gentlemen, or you'll hear during this trial, the use of the words prop gun. And you'll learn a prop gun is this real gun. It's not a toy. It's not made of rubber. It's a real gun. You will also see evidence, ladies and gentlemen, that during the days before that fateful October 21st day, the defendant handled this firearm multiple occasions. You will see video footage of the defendant firing this firearm, working perfectly fine. But you'll see evidence, ladies and gentlemen, that each time the defendant handled this firearm, he did not do a safety check with that inexperienced armorer. And you'll hear that the reason he didn't do a safety check is because he didn't want to offend her. The evidence you will see 
will paint a real life picture of a real life workplace where this defendant mishandled this gun. You will see him using this gun as a pointer to point at people, to point at things. You will see him cock the hammer when he's not supposed to cock the hammer. You will see him put his finger on the trigger when his finger is not supposed to be on the trigger. You will hear about numerous breaches of firearm safety with this defendant and this use of this firearm. And the evidence will show that on the morning of October 21st, 2021, the camera crew walked off set. And you will learn that one of the reasons that camera crew walked out is because they were concerned over safety breaches with the use of firearms. The evidence will show that the morning of October 21st started out a couple of hours behind. They filmed some scenes at this church on the Bonanza Creek Ranch. And you will see that one of those scenes required the defendant to pull out his gun. This was in the morning, pull out his gun and you'll hear the director tell him, pull it out and hold it. And the first time you'll see evidence, the defendant does what the director tells him. But you're, you will hear the director tell you that many times the defendant would do his own thing. So then the director in the morning asked him, okay, do it again, just like you did now. The defendant pulls out the gun, but this time he cocks the hammer. The evidence will show they then broke for lunch. And around 1.30 or so, they came back to this church to do what's called a blocking. The evidence will show that Ms. Hutchins wanted to do a blocking for an insert. And you will learn what a blocking is, just working out the details of the moves of the actor. It wasn't even a rehearsal. You will hear from one of the witnesses who walked into the church and saw the defendant kind of playing with his gun. And then you will see evidence or hear evidence that Ms. Hutchins and Mr. Souza were talking to the defendant about doing this insert. And the insert was just supposed to be from here to here. And it was supposed to be of the defendant just slowly taking his gun out of this holster, out of his holster, and just holding it at an angle. The evidence will show that someone asked the armorer to bring the defendant's gun to him. And she did. She brought it into the church, showed it to David Halls, who you will learn is was the first assistant director. The gun was empty. Ms. Gutierrez then handed the gun to the defendant. But then you will hear that Ms. Gutierrez was given the gun back and she took it and loaded it with dummy rounds. And what you will learn is that dummy rounds are inert rounds. They look like real real rounds, but they are very easy to tell that they are not because they'll rattle. Ms. Gutierrez then went back to the church, showed the revolver to the first assistant director very fast. They only checked about three rounds, very quick. And they missed one round. You will learn that one of the rounds in that revolver was a real round. And the evidence will show that Ms. Gutierrez then handed the gun to the defendant. And what you will learn is that once again, the defendant failed to do a gun check or a safety check with this armor. So he takes the firearm, puts it in his holster. Then Ms. Hutchins and Mr. Souza were doing this blocking. And the evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that the defendant, again, did his own thing. You will hear from an individual by the name of Kent Jorgensen. 
Mr. Jorgensen will tell you that he's been involved in drafting and revising movie set safety rules. You will learn that these movie set safety rules require actors like the defendant to treat every firearm as though it's loaded, to never point a firearm at another person, and to never put your finger on the trigger unless you're prepared to shoot or to destroy whatever's in front of you. The evidence will show that on October 21st, 2021, after that lunch break, the defendant once again violated those set safety rules. And during this blocking, the director had instructed him to just slowly take out that gun and just hold it at an angle. But you will see that the defendant takes it out quickly the first time, points it. And you will hear witness testimony who will tell you the first time he does it, his finger is on or around the trigger. He does it again, takes it out very fast, points it. And once again, you will hear testimony that his finger was on or around the trigger. And the evidence will show that that third and fatal time, he takes it out once again, fast, hammers cocked, he cocks the hammer, points it straight at Ms. Hutchins and fires that gun, sending that live bullet right into Ms. Hutchins' body. You will learn that this bullet was a 45 caliber round that entered Ms. Hutchins' body right underneath her right underarm. It perforated her right lung. It traveled through her spine, lacerating her spinal cord, and then it exited on the left side of her back. That bullet then went into Joel Souza's right shoulder and it came to rest in his back from where doctors removed it once he was transported to St. Vincent's Hospital here in Santa Fe. You will learn, ladies and gentlemen, that Ms. Hutchins did not have the same fate. You will see the aftermath of the shooting and you will see medics frantically working to save Ms. Hutchins, <clears throat> to stabilize her, to transport her, to airlift her to UNM Hospital. But the damage from that bullet was too much. Ms. Hutchins succumbed to her injuries and bled to death. The evidence will show that meanwhile, after the shooting, the defendant began to claim he didn't pull the trigger. The evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that's not possible. You will hear from Mr. Pieta himself who will tell you that gun will not discharge without a pull of the trigger. You will hear from firearms experts who will tell you that gun will not discharge without a pull of that trigger. The evidence will show that law enforcement officials arrived at the scene on October 21st after the shooting and immediately took this gun into their custody. Then later, they asked the FBI for assistance in processing this gun for forensics and examination. You will learn that the gun and some ammunition that was taken from the set and from PDQ arms were sent to the FBI for analysis. You will learn that the gun first went to the DNA section of the lab where a DNA analyst found the defendant's DNA on this gun. And then the gun was transferred to the firearms and tool mark section of the lab where a firearms examiner examined this gun very carefully and closely. Bryce Ziegler, who is the firearms examiner for the FBI, will tell you that when he received this firearm, he first examined it. He didn't see any defects, didn't see any modifications. He tried and he checked the hammer in the three different positions, caulking positions. He checked the quarter caulk position, fine. Checked the half caulk position, fine.
check the full cock position. Fun. And when he held it in the full cock position, you will hear that hammer held until he pulled the trigger. You will also hear that Mr. Ziegler test fired this gun 12 different times. And each time that gun fired as it was designed. Each time when he pulled that trigger, it fired. And he will tell you that not once did this gun malfunction or discharge on its own. Now the evidence will show that because the defendant had been claiming that he didn't pull the trigger, Mr. Ziegler suggested one last test to the Sheriff's Department. Mr. Ziegler told the Sheriff's Department that he could do what's called an accidental discharge test. He obtained authorization to do this test. And you will hear that he left that test for last because that test <clears throat> could potentially damage the gun. Mr. Ziegler went forward after he received this authorization and conducted the accidental discharge test. And you will hear, ladies and gentlemen, that during that test, a couple of the internal components of this firearm damaged. You will hear that the trigger sear and the full cock hammer notch were damaged during the accidental discharge testing. <coughs> The evidence will show, however, that before this accidental discharge testing by the FBI, this gun functioned and worked perfectly fine. You'll see the video footage of the multiple occasions during which the defendant used this firearm on the set, and each time he fired it, it was working just fine. And in fact, you'll hear evidence that the defendant himself admitted in December of 2021 that this gun didn't have any mechanical problems. You will hear from the two of the country's leading experts on firearms forensics, Michael Haig and Lucian Haig. And they will tell you that they examine the revolver and the damaged pieces extensively. They will tell you that the damage to the full cock trigger notch is consistent with the accidental discharge testing that was conducted by the FBI. Lucian Haig will tell you that in August of 2023, he examined the trigger sear, the other piece, and that when he looked at it initially with the naked eye, there was nothing wrong with it. He couldn't see anything. But then he put it under the microscope and he noticed some kind of rough microscopic diagonal lines on the surface of the trigger sear. And since at the time he did not know how Mr. Ziegler had conducted the accidental discharge test, he opined that these very small microscopic lines were likely not caused by the FBI accidental discharge testing, but he could not exclude that as the source of those lines. Then a few weeks ago, Mr. Haig will tell you that he spoke with Mr. Ziegler and he learned how Mr. Ziegler had conducted the accidental discharge test. Mr. Ziegler explained that he affixed that firearm onto a fixed platform and then struck the firearm on six different planes with a rubber mallet. And Mr. Ziegler explained to Mr. Haig that he had not affixed the mallet to another fixed device. Instead, he did it freehand. Mr. Haig will tell you with his 50 plus years of experience as a forensic, firearms forensics expert, he opined or concluded that those very tiny microscopic diagonal lines on the surface of the trigger sear were likely caused by the FBI's accidental discharge test. The evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that regardless of how those tiny microscopic lines got on that trigger sear, these firearms experts will tell you that those would not affect the functionality of this firearm. At the end of this case, ladies and gentlemen, you are going to conclude 
and be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that on October 21st, 2021, that gun the defendant had asked to be assigned worked perfectly fine as it was designed. And that the fatal and one of the main problems that afternoon of October 21st was that the defendant didn't do a gun safety check with that inexperienced armorer. He pointed the gun at another human being, caught the hammer and pulled that trigger in reckless disregard for Ms. Hutchins' safety. And you will be convinced that the only true and just verdict in this case, so that true justice can be served, is a verdict of guilty to involuntary manslaughter. Thank you. Mr. Spiro. Good morning. This was an unspeakable tragedy, but Alec Baldwin committed no crime. He was an actor acting, playing the role of Harlan Rust. An actor playing a character can act in ways that are lethal, that just aren't lethal on a movie set. These cardinal rules, they're not cardinal rules on a movie set. And I don't have to tell you much more about this because you've all seen gunfights in movies. And the reason that can happen is because safety is ensured before the actor. On this movie set, there were people responsible for ensuring the safety of the set and the firearm. Those people failed in their duties, but Alec Baldwin committed no crime. The most critical issue in this case is how a real bullet got on a movie set. The evidence will show that real bullets are never supposed to be on movie sets. Movie sets use dummies and blanks. Movie sets use dummies, fake inert bullets that look like real bullets. They don't go bang for when you want a close up of the gun. You can't tell them apart from live bullets by looking at them, which is why live bullets can be nowhere near a movie set. And if the director wants a shot of the gun going, you know, bang poof, there's blanks that they can use. And those blanks look nothing like real bullets. And they um, are used for those shooting scenes. And, you know, they'll play these videos that they described of Alex, you know, front firearm in the movie going bang poof, you know, and people are conditioned to seeing people firing weapons and thinking that's a dangerous act. That's a dangerous act. And they will play those videos and give you that image to try to tarnish him in your eyes. But that's not what happened here. On this set, there was a real bullet, something that should never be on a movie set, something which has nothing to do with making a movie. And you will hear no evidence, not one word, that Alec Baldwin had anything to do with that real bullet being brought onto that set. The second critical issue in this case is why did a real bullet get loaded into a prop movie gun? It is undisputed that the bullet was loaded into the gun by the armorer, the person on set whose responsibility it was to ensure the gun was safe. And so picture that moment of the armorer placing a live bullet into that firearm. You know, you hear the prosecutor say, you know, he did this or he performed in a certain way. He picked out the biggest gun as his prop. It's to tarnish him in your eyes. You will hear no evidence whatsoever. No evidence that anything Mr. Baldwin did, that something he did in that moment, that horrible moment when she put that bullet in that gun, none of it had anything to do with Alec Baldwin. And finally, the first assistant director's job, the head of safety, Dave Halls, checks it before it goes to the actor. And he will tell you he made a tragic mistake. He failed to detect a live bullet. And Alec Baldwin had nothing to do with that either. So all this evidence that the prosecutor just outlined, all of it, has nothing to do with these critical issues. Nothing. Which leads us to this. The evidence will show that on a movie set, Safety has to occur before the gun is placed in the actor's hands. 
In this case, this unique case on a movie set, the prop gun was placed in Mr. Baldwin's hands and cold gun was announced, meaning it had been checked and double checked by those responsible to ensure the gun was safe. It was just a prop. They all thought it was just a prop and could do no harm. The actor's job is to act, to rehearse, to choreograph his moves, to memorize his lines. He's Harlan Rust. He's an outlaw running for his life, who in the incident in question, he's pulling a six shooter to try to defend himself. That's why the gun has to be safe before it gets into the actor's hands. His mind is somewhere else, in the being of another, a century away, an outlaw. He must be able to take that weapon and use it as the person he's acting would. To wave it, to point it, to pull the trigger like actors do, in ways that would be lethal in the real world, but are not lethal on a movie set. And I'm gonna show you that scene now before lunch. And if we could just play action. I'm gonna go find some help. I don't need no damn help. You're gonna die if we don't. He's wounded on the run. Can play again? Continue. All in rust. If you just stand up nice and slow, toss any weapons you have. He's on the church pew, bleeding, his hand gripping the revolver. He would defend himself against the men in the movie. Play. One more. You good? You ready? Arlen Rust. Did you get up nice and slow, tossing the weapons you have? <clears throat> So the only way to give you that line until he lands, until okay. camera lands. Okay. Yep. Okay, which way? Camera right or left? This way. So camera left for now. I'll stand right here for so, you. So whip it out. Yeah. Okay, well, let me get this little grease. Ready? Okay, ready? Okay, ready? Ready. And set. Ready. Island Russ. <clears throat> they want him to do it again. There's no danger. They want him to do it again. And set ready and action. Island Russ. It's a scene similar to scenes we've all seen in movies and television, performed by thousands of actors. And the scene that continues after lunch is the same scene, it's just not unfortunately captured on videotape. And the scene they envisioned and acted out, that prop gun was positioned in the afternoon so close to the camera that you could see inside, that you could feel it. You could feel that it was loaded and it was loaded, of course, with dummies. Dummies to make it look like a real gun. But this one time, one of those dummies was a real bullet. The real bullet was not known to anyone in that church. Amongst the actors, directors, and crew in the scene, everyone was doing exactly how they go about their business every day on a movie, not as if some lethal element had been included in the environment. You will see creativity and movement and everyone talking and vibrant. No one had any idea that this venomous, toxic element had been inserted into this magic they were creating. But it did. It entered that place. It killed an amazing person. It wounded another. And it changed lives forever. And so to find out what happened on that movie set, you, knew, you need to do something that the prosecutors could never do. 
you have to step back and remember what they were doing on a movie set. What were Helena Hutchins, the cinematographer, Joel Souza, the director, and Alec Baldwin, the actor, doing on Bonanza Creek Ranch? You know, movies and magic have always been closely associated. The first people that made movies were magicians. And this imagination that happens in movies, you know, King Kong, he can stand above a city and Superman can fly, horses and snakes and gun battles. For this to all work, for cinematography, what Helena did to work, for acting to work, you have to be so close to the barrier of real and imagined that the viewer feels that they're there, that it's real. The viewer can't see strings from the stuntman. The stuntman must leap. The snake must hiss. And guns happen in movies all over this country for many decades. Bang, bang. You've all seen it. Guns have been an element of theater and film and television since the earliest of times. Depictions of war and combat, Spartacus, it stirs audiences because it feels real. Later films, Platoon, Apocalypse Now, they showed the unvarnished realities of war. This ranch, Santa Fe, it had been the scene to many gunfights and movie scenes, well before Alec was even born. Laramie, Butch and the Sundance Kid, and these Westerns. The evidence will show that guns are in movies because movies are about people's lives and guns are in people's lives. So let's talk about the evidence and how the lethal bullet got there. How did this happen and how did it unfold? The evidence will be the following. Everybody on a movie set has a role. The armor or armors, the director directs, the actor acts. They work in harmony, but they have a division of responsibility. Safety being important has the first assistant director, whose name is Dave Halls, above the, the, the armor and the sort of the safety of the set. And on that day in question, the cast and the creative directors and crew in the church, it's a, it's a fake church. Their actors are not in their normal clothes, it's costumes. There's debris falling from the ceiling, it's fake debris. And they yell out cold gut. And that is an important term you're gonna learn in this case. It means that the gun is cold. No one need worry. But even that requires a little bit more explanation. Cold gun doesn't mean no live bullets. There are for sure 100% no live bullets on movie sets. That's unimaginable. Cold means you don't even have the fake, fake blank poof um, dump, uh, uh, in it. You don't need to worry even about, you know, eye gear or, 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 or um, earplugs for, for that fake bang. It means it's empty, inert, cosmetic, can do no harm. Cold guns can't hurt people. It's impossible, literally impossible for a cold gun to hurt somebody. You, you, you could hurt you more by dropping it on your foot. And that's why these artists are carrying on in their art. Cold gun, gun, all clear to go. And the armorer on this set hands a prop gun to Alec, like she had done times before, like people have done with him in movies for a generation. And he's there. He's in the movie set church with his movie set gear and his holster, and he takes his movie set gun. And he's deeply focused in that moment on his character. The artists, the crew members, they're, they're moving around him. Again, no, no eye, eye gear or earplugs, nothing to protect against. They carry on. They practice. They rehearse. They take a lunch break. Some folks leave. Some don't. They continue the scene. Dave Halls, the head of safety, is actually practicing the movement so they can frame. They can frame the, the footage that will happen after lunch. And the prop cold gun comes back. The prop cold gun comes back. Cold gun. They call it again. Same gun, again, safe. The first assistant director, Dave Halls, head of safety for the entire film, a man with decades of experience, comes and takes the additional step and inspects the gun, verifies again, cold gun. Everyone relax. Go back to focus on the making of a movie. There's nothing in the gun that can hurt anybody. And Alex sits on that pew. And they, the creative directors, the crew, they're moving around him, in front of him. And Harlan Rust, he begins, like the prosecutor told you, rehearsing, acting. This is a completely mundane, uneventful routine act on a movie set, on a movie set. And so everybody carries on, 
Nobody fathomed, imagined, foresaw any possible danger. They moved around Alec as he practiced his draw. As the prosecutor put it, working out the details of the move in the aster. He does it, does it again, does it in a different way. Nobody bats an eye. And they will tell you that the investigation revealed that Baldwin was practicing drawing and pointing the weapon of the scene with guidance and instruction from Helena Hutchins and Joel Souza. The gun goes off. Everybody's shocked. Alec is startled. He, 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 all, he immediately says, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, I didn't mean to shoot the I, I didn't pull the trigger. Immediately. What the hell just happened? They collectively explain. Shock turns to panic. 911 is called. Out at Bonanza Creek Ranch right now, we've had two people shot on a movie set accidentally. He said someone was shot. Two people accidentally with okay. gun, gun shot at on movie set Bonanza Creek Ranch. Okay. Send it, send it. I'll connect you with medical dispatcher. Don't need that. Santa Fe Fire and EMS wants to locate some emergency. No, uh, Bonanza Creek Ranch has had two people accidentally shot on a movie set by a prop gun. We need help immediately. Okay. But this fucking AD that yelled at me at lunch because asking about revisions. This motherfucker, did you see him lean over my desk and yell at me? He's got disgusted guns. He's responsible for what happened. Did you see how many? No, no, no. I'm a script supervisor. How, I how many people were injured? Two I w that I know of. I was sitting, we were rehearsing, and it went off, and I ran out. Accidentally shot on a movie set. With a prop gun, the fucking AD, it was his responsibility. Not a word about Alec Baldwin. While they're en route, police EMS, the cast and crew are outside trying to figure out what happened, frantic, talking to those responsible for the prop and its safety. The armorer is yelling, sorry. Hall's the first assistant director is panicked. The prop master, Sarah Zachary, I, I don't know exactly where she is at, at, at that point, but they check the gun fervishly. They take the ammo out of the gun. They look at it. What the heck happened? They go back to the prop cart that houses the ammo. They're touching the gun and manipulating the gun, emptying it. They go and move some stuff off the prop cart, trying to figure it out. Sarah Zachary, the head of props, will tell you she threw some stuff out. And, and eventually, of course, EMS and police arrive pretty soon thereafter. And Helena Hutchins and Joel Souza, the director, are transported to the hospital where Helena tragically passes away. And, and I'm not going to be asking questions about her condition after she was wounded or the medical interventions that followed. Her injuries, the efforts to revive her are not in dispute in this case. Um, the evidence will, will be there. The prosecutor may present some of these emotionally charged images, um, but we're not going to be asking questions about that. And it's not an issue in dispute in this case. Um, and, and, uh, you jurors are allowed to ask yourselves whether or not that should be the focus or the focus should be the evidence. So police enter the scene. They have lapel cameras. Thank God they have lapel cameras. You want to see what happens? The evidence will show you can play the videotape. Want to see if they take the right gun? Play the videotape. Want to make sure what the people said or did they're remembering correctly? Play the videotape. And so they immediately recover the prop gun and they secure it. That's off to the side. And, and the reason that you preserve things in the moment is so that you know what existed in the moment, the evidence in the moment, the people and the witnesses and what they said in the moment. These folks, the members of Rust, they'd never been through anything like this before. That is why what they originally said matters so much in this case. If you remember anything I say today as the evidence proceeds, remember that. Look at the evidence of what the people of Rust said and did that day. Life changes, memories change. There are human motivations, internal pressure, external pressure. That's why preservation is so important. So the police continue. In terms of the prop cart and the prop ammo that's on the cart, it's manipulated, altered, kind of messy. Um, and, you know, at this accidental shooting on a movie set, the police begin to make some mistakes. No one had ever investigated a prop gun on a movie set before. They recover the prop gun, but they don't wear gloves. 
They don't have the prop car inside the crime scene. Someone moves it onto the crime scene. People start touching it and showing, okay, this is a dummy, this is a blank. And then they make another mistake that, that matters in this case um, um, with some more significance, which is that they don't secure the prop truck that houses the cart. See, that cart that they roll off comes from a truck where all of the ammunition, all of the firearms are, and that's where they're stored. They don't secure the prop truck for several days. Um, and then the prop house that supplies the truck, that supplies the cart, they don't secure for over a month. A lot of mistakes. They had never investigated it, case in a movie set. But they had the prop gun. That was key. Um, and so they needed to figure out where the live bullet came from. They had the shell casing, Starline brass. That's the, that's the sort of make. You'll hear that phrase, Starline brass. And the police were right to focus on that. That was the lethal element. And so they work outward. Makes good enough sense. Folks around the ammo and the gun to be interviewed at the precinct. The armorer at the precinct. She loaded the live bullet. Hall's head of safety. He double checked. And Alec walks up to the police. You'll see this early today. And he says, I'm here, whatever you want to do, whatever you need me to do, just tell me where to go. And uh, Sarah Zachary, the prop master who threw out the stuff, the cart, they, they missed her that night um, to bring to the precinct. But the rest of them at the precinct. And thankfully, we have the lapel cameras. And then we cleared, they cleared the gun outside after uh, his request. And I witnessed them clear it and saw the police. Okay. So the one was the one that was missing, the one that fired, we don't know, but all the other ones were proper. I can turn, I can pause this. I can turn this off. Move on. The, that was just a, a quick snapshot of the scene. Let, let, let's approach uh, this. This is this, Ms. Johnson. They consented to be good. The remaining witnesses from inside the church are interviewed on the scene. They're interviewed with lapel cameras. They're interviewed by the lead detective, Detective Cano. And those witnesses, some of them will come in here and testify. And not a single one of them will tell you anything different than what I'm about to tell you about the evidence. The gun was double checked, verified it was a cold gun, not an actor's responsibility to check. Safety was ensured before. Alec was doing his practicing, his rehearsing, his movements. People manipulate and point guns on movie sets. The gun went off during the rehearsal. No one saw him intentionally pull the trigger. It was obviously a tragic accident, but Alec committed no homicide. Alec took the gun from those charged with its safety. He did not tamper with it. He did not load it himself. He did not leave it unattended. It completed his costume and his character. It was an actor handling a prop and integrating it into the character of Harlan Rust. There was a dedicated professional there, off camera, whose sole sacred responsibility was that prop safety. And Dave Halls, the head of safety, was there by her side. Everyone relied on that. And it was tragic that they let them down. He was just acting as he has done for generations and it was the safety apparatus that failed them all. So law enforcement continues. They need to find the live bullet. That was the lethal element. So they, led by Detective Cano, execute a search warrant on the church. And that's what law enforcement does. They immediately go to a judge. They say, this is what we need to do. They go into the church urgently before anything can be altered. They're confirming it was an accident, not a crime in the church. They search for guns and ammunition, videos and photos. There was no further answer in the church. They had the prop gun. They had all those witnesses secured. Their statements are clear. Alec had committed no crime, but the bullet was a mystery. And so they focus on the bullet, the critical lethal bullet, and how did it enter the movie set? So they had the prop cart, and then they go do the warrant on the prop truck. And so at that point, and I'm going to put up a photo so that you can see some of these individuals are. Um, they're trying to figure out when they go to the truck, where is what is the source of the lethal, lethal bullet? And so they execute a warrant on the truck approximately a week later. The Seth Kenny that you heard about in the prosecutor's opening, the supplier, 
for the set. He's there. Sarah Zachary, the prop master, she's there. And they walk through what's inside of the prop truck with law enforcement. But there's no answer to the lethal bullet. And, you know, the, 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 this case then takes on, you know, uh, uh, all this pressure. You know, the media begins swirling. Where is the lethal bullet? How did it got, get on that movie set? And what about that actor, Alec Baldwin, who had nothing to do with why the bullet got on the movie set? And so police and prosecutors, they work hand in hand, meeting after meeting, trying to find the lethal bullet. Meeting with Seth Kenny, meeting with Sarah Zachary, the prop master, the supplier. Where is it? And about a month after the incident, Sarah Zachary finally sits down with law enforcement to answer some questions. And um, she explains to them that she, she threw away some stuff. She, she disposed of some stuff. Um, and they, the prosecutors and police keep meeting, swirling media. And then at that point, they go to the last step, right? Done the cart, gone to the truck, met with Sarah Zachary. And they go execute a search warrant on, as the prosecutor told you, PDQ, the prop house. And again, Seth Kenny's there to greet them, let them in. And they don't find the lethal bullet. They never did. They never did. And as things roll into police and prosecutors, cell phones and photos and forensics, looking for this shiny object, they found another shiny object. Instead of trying to find the source of the lethal bullet, they focused on Mr. Baldwin. But Mr. Baldwin was like every other actor. He goes bang, bang in movies. He's told when guns are cold or not. He rehearses and acts as his character. Safety proceeds before the actor. Once the actor has the prop gun, he can handle it however a person he's acting as would. A properly cleared gun can't hurt anybody. And so they told you about some of the things that Alex said in the statements that they will, they will take or, or pick out a few lines from. But he won't tell you anything different that he, that he took a gun loaded and cleared by the armor in the A day. He made motions with the gun as he was rehearsing. He didn't intentionally pull the trigger. The gun just went off. And he does say, I didn't have a problem with the gun before. And this idea, you know, that they said that he, that he would have, he didn't want to check because he would offend them, you know, in this moment, he, he's been doing this for 40 years, the evidence will show. And he has habits. And there are also SAG guidelines that tell actors what to do and what not to do. And the SAG guidelines don't tell actors to check the gun. You will see them. That's not the actor's role. And so I guess the point that they're trying to make is that why in this specific moment, he doesn't break his habit of 40 years and, and check it differently and sort of insult them this one time. You know, if he had done that and started playing with the gun in that way, they'd be saying, arrogant actor, why is he doing that? So they will play these statements, Alex statements. You're going to hear a man in shock and grief, a father, a, a, an artist, worried about his family. You hear he's, you know, a, a, on one of the calls, he's, he's going to meet with the decedent's family, the Hutchins family, and he's upset about that. He will talk to law enforcement. He will call them. He doesn't need a lawyer. He didn't commit a crime. He will call them and offer to meet and speak over and over again. And ask anyone in the acting world. Actors know. Actors rely on armors and point guns and shoot guns. The Armorers Act, what they did, is clear and proven. The head of safety, you will learn, took responsibility for his verification failure. But Alec committed no homicide. So law enforcement didn't have a homicide case against Alec Baldwin. But they changed the question. You heard the prosecutor tell you about this. Did he pull the trigger? Did he pull the trigger? Did he intentionally pull the trigger? And if, if he did, of course, that would only make his statement incorrect, right? That would mean he would have misspoke and incorrect, you know, and I want to stop for a moment and just tell you, because you're going to hear a lot of testimony, expert testimony that the prosecutor told you about the gun functioning imperfectly. Did he let the hammer down when he cocked it? Did he hit the trigger? Did he, in a calculated manner, as the prosecutor met, uh, made a motion, you know, fire the gun like that? And when this issue is discussed, it's easy to sort of pull yourself into courtroom land and away from a movie set. On a movie set, you're allowed to pull the trigger. So even if, even if he intentionally pulled the trigger like the prosecutor just demonstrated, that doesn't make him guilty of homicide. 
He did not know or have any reason to know that gun was loaded with a live bullet. That's the key. That live bullet is the key. That is the lethal element. But again, as the prosecutor told you, they, if they could prove that he intentionally pulled the trigger and he was in perfect, imprecise, wrong with what he said, then maybe you take that and you say he's lying. And if he's a liar, he committed homicide. And so what they do is they take the prop gun. They're blinded by the shot. They're blinded by trying to disprove Alec. They take it and they order a destructive test on the firearm. They order the FBI to take a test that they know will destroy the firearm. It's a pointless, unnecessary test where they blindly try to make this big case by taking a mallet and smashing the firearm. At the time that they did that, they knew that Alec had, had maintained, adamantly maintained, that he was manipulating the hammer and the gun just went off. That the witnesses said it went off out of nowhere. That there are these accidental discharges that happen on the set. That guns have issues in the real world. That this gun had a hair trigger. And the owner's manual of this specific gun actually says that if you load it with a live round or any round in the chamber, in, in that last position, and you drop it like you see a cowboy in a movie, this type of old cowboy gun can accidentally go off. I don't remember hearing anything about that. The evidence will show that. So rather than trying to answer the question of what happened, they proceed with the destructive test. They eliminate the one item, <clears throat> the one item that could prove what Alex said and believed. They didn't offer him a chance to test the gun. They didn't take the gun apart before they broke it and destroyed it and look at its inner workings. They didn't turn on their videotape. They just destroyed it. Can't ever be tested in the same condition it was in that day. Won't ever allow Alec to show his truth. And the destruction of this gun that you will hear in this evidence is symbolic of this entire case. Because the officers will tell you at that point, they weren't really investigating anymore. They were trying to disprove Alec, to get Alec, to have this day. And so after the destruction of the firearm, they hired some expert witnesses you heard about to, to pick up the pieces, so to speak. And the state retained Lucian Haig, an expert with over half a century of experience. And he will come into court and he will tell you he's never seen anything like this in his entire career. They conducted a pointless test a test that would lead to inevitable destruction of the firearm. There were other correct tests that they could have done to prove whether or not it could have accidentally discharged. None of the experts can test the gun in the condition it was in on the day in question. Why? Not because of something that Alec Baldwin or the crew members of Russ did. They were all clear. The gun just went off. But because of something that law enforcement did. And they deprived him of that opportunity. However, Lucian Haig will tell you that in his analysis, he did find modification that he thought likely pre-existed the FBI testing. And what that modification means and, and how it impacted the gun is hard to perfectly know, of course. But it, it was a modification on an important part, the critical part of the firearm. And it was important enough for them to put into a report and to write a new opinion about. They felt this revelation had to be sent to prosecutors. And they maintained that position that this modification was a matter of import for almost a year. And then a few weeks ago before trial, they just took it back. They just took it back. You will get to see the circumstances of that take back. How far they would go for the shiny object. They never solved the question of the lethal bullet. They destroyed the gun. And all they were left with is Alec Baldwin and the movie they intend to put on. But because they never solved the lethal bullet, they eliminated the prop gun. There will not be one witness, not one shred of evidence in this trial that Alec knew or should have known the gun was loaded with a live round. So they can't prove. They can't prove their high profile homicide. So they, they will proceed to then here and now tell you about other things. Other evidence that you will hear that has nothing to do with what happened in the church on October 21st. That the movie said as a, as a whole was improper or anything. 
that he that they hired the wrong armorer. I think I heard in in opening. The, the, the evidence will show that the armor was hired by somebody else, trained by somebody else, had done gun scenes on Rust with somebody else before Alec even got there. She was the daughter and the apprentice of the most famous and well-respected armorer in Hollywood. And she had just loved, left serving being an armorer for Nicolas Cage on another Western. Then they'll come in and they'll say, but what about the movie guidelines? You heard about Mr. Jorgensen and the movie guidelines. That, that one of the protocols wasn't followed, or there was a set safety issue about, about something unrelated to this. Like these movie guidelines on, on, on a set or the things of Navy SEALs and NASA. The guidelines were followed. They followed the safety guidelines. Actors don't check the weapons. Safety is ensured by dedicated personnel. So they will say, you know, but there had been accidental discharges, on the set that guns had fired accidentally prior, not related to Alec, by the way. You know, but again, that's the people we looked at. Hannah Gutierrez Reed's fault, Sarah Zachary's fault, perhaps, Dave Hall's fault, faults, workplace issues. Some of them will end up, and you will hear the witnesses in this case, many of them have brought civil lawsuits. You know, and you'll hear that, you know, in those civil lawsuits, they're presenting evidence to try to meet a burden, not a not a criminal beyond a reasonable doubt homicide trial burden, but they're gonna to try to prove their cases in civil courts. And that's where faults and accidents are at worst 99% worked out, not here. But you'll hear these members of the Rust crew come in here. They'll try to make sense of this for you. Some of them have sued. Some of them are in grief. Some of them are in grief and have sued. And part of this grief they feel that everybody feels is understandable. And what they will do is they will tell you, you know, if, if only we had had a second armorer, one of them will say, if only Dave Halls had checked better, if only the camera hadn't been right there and Ms. Hutchins wasn't leaning over the camera, if only I myself did this, if only Alec did that, this is natural, their testimony. It's part of the human condition. It's part of grief. Objection, None of them knew. As I was saying, the witnesses in their grief will look for reasons to try to make sense of this tragedy. But again, none of them knew or should have known about the lethal bullet either. No one had any idea that it was on that set or in that gun. In that world, they were all in it together. And you will hear that none of this other stuff has anything to do with those two critical questions we started with. Why there was a live bullet on set? why the armor replaced it in the gun, and of course, why the head of safety failed to detect it. None of it speaks to whether Alec knew or should have known those things. He didn't, no one on that set did. It was not foreseeable. You will hear that word from the witnesses and from, the, and from eventually the instructions, foreseeable. This was anything other than foreseeable. And they must prove beyond any and all reasonable doubt that this was foreseeable total indifference to human life, that death might occur. He's an actor. He's an actor. But here we are at a homicide trial. And so they will pull and they will pull witnesses and, and witnesses will be cross-examined. They will push themselves to the edge of truth and beyond. You know, these things about, you know, Alec didn't notice this or Alec didn't notice that. I want to make sure that you're clear on something that the evidence will show. He had been filming on that set for a handful of days. The evidence will show he had just gotten there. It's not as if he had been there for months and months and noticed things and failed things. And he had just gotten there. You don't notice every little thing when you start at a new place and when you're in the character of Harlan Rust. But they will push forward and they will have gaps in the evidence as well. Don't expect you to be hearing and for them to call the first AD head of safety. I don't know if you'll be hearing from the lead detective, Kanak, who investigated this case, the lead detective, or the sergeant that supervised him, Sergeant Zook. I don't think you'll hear from Mr. Schilling, who was the lead investigator for the prosecutors. And so as you hear this, the ju you jurors can, can assess about that gap of evidence. And there's one thing that I can tell you, you will not hear also. You will not hear from an actor or an expert in acting. 
And so they will play the videotapes of Alec Baldwin, the actor, acting. They will show you perhaps over and over again him in shooting scenes. Bad Alec. Bad Alec shooting a gun the wrong way in a movie scene. They will try to get you to picture that and forget that this was a movie set in the first place. And you will see actors in a Western acting. And your mind might go to your favorite gun scene in your favorite movie. You may picture actors and actresses doing exactly what you see here. The other actors in Rust doing the same thing that Mr. Baldwin was doing. But when you come back from that moment, remember, this is a homicide trial. And you will see, you will see soon that the reason they play those videos of him over and over is because they don't have any ev evidence of actual homicide. And you will learn the truth. Not a day goes by when we don't wish Alec had saved her life. But never, the witnesses will tell you, in the history is something that an actor has done, intercepted a live bullet from a prop gun. No actor in, in history. No one could have imagined or expected an actor to do that. So just remember that truth. So when they cry out justice, justice is truth. This was an unspeakable tragedy. Alec Baldwin committed no crime. Thank you. All right, thank you. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna take our um, morning um, bathroom break. So please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Um, and um, follow what Mr. Bing tells you to do. And um, what, we'll see you back here about 20th. All right, thank you. All rise to the jury.